Welcome everyone to the um, breakout session for Justice and Community Safety, this fantastic on-air conference. Um, thank you everyone. I've really been enjoying the presentation so far and the level of engagement and activity. So I really want to set a good bar for this and uh, welcome any questions you have of the presenters. Um, firstly, let me start by joining in the acknowledgement of the traditional owners and the land in which we meet and pay my respect to the elders past, present and emerging and all cultures that contribute towards making up the community which we're lucky to serve. Um, how topical and timely is this, is this uh, session, justice and community safety, um, add in a world where the expectations are sifting, shifting in seismic proportions, where uh, the roles and responsibilities of those entrusted with justice and community safety are growing and changing at such a rate that we could never have, prevent, never have predicted it before. Um, think about the degrees of digital transformation, social and economic shifts, and let's just throw in a pandemic for for good measure and justice and community safety is not only a moving feast but something that's growing and changing as potentially as we speak. We're very lucky to have four presenters this morning. Um, I'll pass on the apologies of Ben Bjarns and a uh, uh, senior constable from the Queensland Police um, and our colleague who's had an unfortunate family emergency is unable to attend to give his presentation in person. It'll be a pre-recorded presentation. Um, ben completed his church, uh, Churchill Fellow on uh, fellowship on um, uh, police responses to LGBTIQ communities and has been doing some fantastic work in furthering that study and making the most of the opportunity the church has presented him. Uh, Mr. Morris Carlos, an assistant commissioner in the police service, we're, we're pumped with um, Queensland police in this session, fortunately. Um, um, completed his Churchill Fellow a long, long time ago in 2005 and six around um, in the investigation and prevention of Indigenous uh, children death, uh, child deaths and he's a currently serving Assistant Commissioner in the Queensland Police. Um, next up, we have Tony Craig, who works in youth justice currently, has been involved in the Atkinson Report for Youth Justice and some current um, work happening right now in that space, who uh, travelled in Denmark, Sweden, Finland and in Canada and um, uh, sought to develop um, innovative programs and services to prevent and intervene in youth crime, another topical area for today. And lastly, but not leastly, a colleague from the Queensland Fire and Emergency Services um, who, who uh, Justin did his Churchill Fellowship in 2016, um, particularly looking at um, fire safety in large dwellings and, and uh, multi-occupied venues um, and provided a significant exposure to one of the very notable and sad events at the Greenfield Tower Fire in London. So please, I, I encourage you to, in the discussion forum to add questions and and uh, provoke some discussion later on, really challenge the presenters. And I'll pass over now for Ben Bjarnson's pre-recorded presentation. Thank you. Tony Craig, up next. In 2016, and Tony works in the Department of um, Youth Justice still today as a Director of Policy, Strategy and Legislation. Um, a very topical and um, political area, as you as you would see from the coverage and and um, sometimes the the uh, hyperbole around um, um, youth and their role in um, community safety. Um, Tony's fellowship saw her spend several weeks in Denmark, Sweden, Finland, and Canada, and she brought her experience in really practical ways to her work when she was a member of the task force to deliver the, to deliver the 2018 Atkinson report on youth justice. And she's currently working on some really seminal reviews that can help again use evidence and use the proof to guide our response to preventing and intervening in um, uh, in youth crime and youth safety in the community. Um, Tony, welcome to speak today and we look forward to hearing your presentation. Welcome. Good morning, everybody. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the various lands on which we all gather today. For me, it's the lands of the Turrible people, as I'm situated on the north side of Maywa, the Brisbane River. I recognise their connections to land, wind, water and community and pay my respects to them, their elders past, present and emerging. Next slide, please. So I chose to visit and I learned an awful lot in my travels to Canada, Denmark, Finland and Sweden. There was a lot of thought that went into the selection of those countries when I embarked on the Churchill Fellowship. 
Firstly, they're all liberal democracies with well-developed government structures, social policy and human services. So they make an ideal comparison with a country like Australia and indeed the state of Queensland. So Canada, I chose because while having had previously very high rates of youth incarceration and offending in the past, had over the previous 10 years seen a dramatic reduction in youth offending, particularly in British Columbia. And that's one of the provinces I ended up visiting along with Ontario and Alberta. Canada also represents a really useful comparison and learning opportunity for Australia due to its similar colonial history, dispossession of its indigenous peoples and a similar legal and government system based on the Westminster system. Now, the three Nordic countries that I visited, while they are very different from Australia, there was a lot to learn. Together, they share a similar and long-standing progressive approach to both social and criminal justice policy. They have well-renowned high rates of taxation, but as a result, a very well-resourced welfare system and a strong culture of community responsibility for the well-being of others, particularly those who are vulnerable. All the Nordic countries have very low rates of youth offending and negligible rates of youth incarceration. They all treat children who commit offences as being in need of support rather than punishment alone and have a standard minimum age of criminal responsibility of 15 years. So that also spans Norway, Iceland and the Faroe Islands and Greenland, I believe. In comparison, in Canada, that minimum age of criminal responsibility is 12 years of age and in Australia, in all states and territories, it's 10 years. Finally, another factor that assisted my um, learning in those uh, countries is the fact that English is so widely spoken and understood. So that really facilitated my initial approach and welcome and learning experience in those countries. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna take you through a few of the highlights um, from each of the countries, not all of them, it's not possible to do that in the time available, but some key things that I took away from each country and have to some extent been able to um, influence in terms of our own uh, reform agenda here in Queensland. So as I mentioned, I visited three provinces in Canada, all of which to some extent had experienced decreasing rates of youth offending. And I've shown many examples of the spectrum of activity that have contributed to those decreases. Everything from crime prevention activities, responses to substance misuse, um, extensive uh, tailored education programs for vulnerable people in particular, well-developed oversight bodies and um, alternative custody programs. So one of the st distinguishing features that I noticed about Canada is it has a very well-resourced crime prevention agency called Public Safety Canada. That's not its Public Safety Canada's only function, but that's where it sits in the administration. P the PSC delivers funding to crime prevention programs with innovation strongly encouraged and five years of funding for new programs to allow sufficient time for them to develop and to deliver outcomes and to be able to be evaluated. So some of the examples of programs that I was able to visit in three of the provinces were those that were tackling drug use and gang, gang membership. Raphead in Edmonton, Surrey Wraparound in Surrey, British Columbia, and Time for Change in Ottawa. All had a strong focus on education and training and creating positive pathways for young people, but always tailored to the young person's abilities and learning history. So mainstream schools were definitely not seen as the answer. Public Safety Canada also provides dedicated funding for First Nations communities to deliver their own crime prevention programs. And those are often in partnership with police, local schools or other justice agencies. So Tawasson, again in British Columbia, I visited is a com community toward the south near the US border. It's, it's a standout example of a small First Nations community that's been able to really turn around previous offending, domestic violence and general violence in that community as a result of a combination of things, including government investment from Public Safety Canada. There's been capacity building through partnerships with government, government agencies, but importantly, those gains have been achieved through um, the establishment of a modern treaty, which has provided security of land and sea resources and income streams for that particular community. And those income streams have been achieved through them owning the land, being able to lease it, um, develop housing, um, housing areas and also commercial property development. So 
So another another key feature that was a real standout for me in Canada is uh, restorative justice. So while it originated in, I think, New Zealand originally and has spread throughout the world, it's found in various forms throughout Canada, but differs very much in terms of its implementation. The, the legislation that governs um, the Youth Justice, the Youth Criminal Justice Act in Canada, um, covers the whole of the country, but different provinces are able to implement things depending upon what their local circumstances are. So what I saw was very ubiquitous use of uh, restorative justice in Alberta and quite a different model where grassroots community groups could apply for funding to deliver restorative justice and they were resourced by the administration and the province. Um, in comparison, I saw restorative justice programs in British Columbia that were delivered by non-government organisations and police. So very, very different depending upon where you went. Another key feature of British Columbia that I'll end my foray into Canada for you about was the use of what they call full-time attendance centres. So these are um, uh, residential facilities, if you like, that accommodate only a very small number of young people, four or five at most. Um, they provide a therapeutic environment where young people's um, offending behaviour can be addressed. Some of them have schools that are um, situated within, within that um, residential environment. Um, and there's a high level of supervision for those young people. So they are used as an alternative uh, as an alternative to detaining young people in a custodial environment. And the two custody centres in um, British Columbia have seen a significant decline. And what's interesting is that um, at the time I visited and reinforced in my subsequent contact, contacts with people in British Columbia is that they're facing similar challenges to us here in Queensland and, and Australia. So declining rates of youth offending, but high rates of youth offending remain among a, a, a small cohort of young people with extremely complex needs. Next slide, please. Okay, I'm gonna take you to Denmark now. Now, Denmark was the first place that I looked at seriously in terms of visiting because of its really strong and long-standing focus on crime prevention. That ended up being seen in the other countries I visited, but it was very, very strong in Denmark. So. They have an extensive network of 98 school social services and policing partnerships. So, so they are formal partnerships. They operate in all local government areas, so that's 98 of them, with resources allocated depending upon the population size. And they're staffed by consultants who are generally trained criminologists or social workers. That network is supported by a national body called the Danish Crime Prevention Council, or DKR, that body coordinates training, research and development and communication across the country. It also provides secretariat support for a democratically elected governance body of consultants from across the country. So I had the great privilege of visiting um, two SSPs in regional Uland and in Copenhagen, as well as the Danish Crime Prevention Council. And all those people were a wealth of opportunity, of, of opportunity and um, information. So just to give you a sense of the types of activities that those SSPs deliver in their communities, they can range from and do from very universal programs, such as parenting programs for parents of teenagers. And that's not necessarily targeting parents who are struggling with their teenagers, that's just how to parent a teen. So that's what I mean by a universal program and they're available to everybody who's anyone who's interested. They also deliver more specific programs at a group level for vulnerable groups of young people. So it might be a, an after school or alternative school program or a uh, recreation program for young people who are starting to dabble or being seen to be a risk cohort. Through to case management and intensive case management involving social workers and psychiatrists and whoever's needed for families and young people who have particularly complex needs. So the SSP activities are not legislated but there is the ability for information about children and young people to be shared for the purposes of crime prevention, and that's covered by uh, the Social Services Act. Importantly, this legislation specifies that information cannot be used in criminal investigations. So that's really, uh, that's quite significant, and the SSP consultants describe that as a game changer because it allows people to be, people in need to be identified and intervene with early without criminalising them. So really, really important. Next slide, please. 
like you like to take you to Finland now and I'll just start with a quote from one of the social workers who was my initial point of contact in Finland Tina Vogt Ariksinen when I asked Tina about what happens in terms of crime prevention in Finland she replied with in Finland we believe that good social policy is the best crime prevention policy that interaction was really the start of my professional love affair and ongoing interest with all things Finnish in Finland. As you may know, it's renowned for its progressive and well-resourced education system. Similarly, its human service or welfare systems are similarly well-resourced and de delivered by a combination of government and non-government organisations who have very well-trained staff working with vulnerable children and families in professions that are highly valued. That includes police, Policing is con considered um, a highly uh, respectable and valued profession with high levels of public trust, even though it has one of the lowest ratios of police to population in the world. Interestingly, volunteerism is also very high in Finland. And I saw that in a number of the youth shelters and youth outreach centres that I visited. And they have um, more people than they can actually accommodate in those programs. The other interesting feature is that there are no youth detention centres in Finland. That means that on the rare occasion, a young person does commit a particularly heinous offence, they actually have to unfortunately be detained in an adult prison and usually in isolation. Fortunately, that's a very rare occurrence. What they do have though for young people who are engaging in antisocial or criminal behaviour, they have um, a network of, that translates as school homes or kolukoti. So they're residential institutions across the country bigger than the um, facilities that I described in Canada. Um, and they have, I was able to visit one of those uh, a couple of hours north of Helsinki. And I stayed the night there. It was really amazing because they have, so while it's a residential um, setting, it provides accommodation for family members to go and visit on a, on, a, on a reasonably regular basis. And I was able to stay in that accommodation. Within that environment, school is a very important part of the programming um, and it's tailored again to the individual young people. And within that particular facility, there was also a behaviour management unit. So that's intensive supervision and care for young people with really challenging behaviours. And I got to spend an evening uh, with a group of young people in that facility um, with the staff present, a little nervous at the start, but they were lovely. We shared a meal um, and the kids um, amazingly had quite a quite a good command of English. Um, and I'm told that's through their, uh, their frequent use of gaming platforms. So um, in terms of crime prevention, I'll just take you to another program. There's a photo just in the in the top of this slide that depicts a group of um, staff from a program in the northern suburbs of Helsinki. The program's called Ankuri or it translates as anchor program. It actually operates in all the major centres in Finland and it's a co-located partnership between police, health and social services staff. Often they're located at police stations, sometimes they're not. This particular one was located in a police station, but they also undertake outreach as needed. So you can see the, um, there's policing staff in that photo. Sorry, it's not a very big one, but they, they remain ununiformed when they're part of that anchor group. So essentially how they operate is that they rally around young people under 15 who come to the attention of authorities for antisocial or criminal behaviour and they apply a family centred approach, a little bit, a little like the family led decision making process that's occurring in Queensland at present. So they contact family members and invite them to a conversation to facilitate an agreement about how the child's behaviour will be addressed and that is most, like, most often followed up by a case management process that will involve depending upon the child and family's need, health services, recreation services, social workers, and, and mentoring also plays a significant part. Next slide, please. So finally, I'd like to take you to Sweden. So once again, crime prevention plays a really key role in dealing with youth crime in Sweden. So partnerships between police and the social services agencies are an important feature. There's a national agreement that formalises that formalises the arrangement and positions crime prevention as a shared responsibility. There's also, like Denmark, a coordinated and centralised body that provides resources and training to local initiatives delivered through social action groups. So these are the equivalent of the SSPs that I described in Denmark. There's not as many of them. There's about 21 operating across 
Sweden. They work in close collaboration with the municipality based family centres. So family centres are also found in, um, in Norway and in Finland as well, although I didn't get to go and visit one of those. So I visited a family centre in uh, Stockholm in Sweden. So these centres provide cradle to early childhood services to all families and individuals, and some of them in the larger centres also provide services such as substance misuse treatment to adults. So they're provided in a non-stigmatising, universally accepted space where people already go to have their physical as well as their social and emotional health needs met. So that means young parents may turn up for immunisations of their babies. There's early childhood support groups at one end of the spectrum. There's a range of parenting programs for various age groups that are delivered. There's substance misuse programs, as I mentioned, for adults, but also for teens and also uh, community service programs for young people who have run foul of the law. Now, community service we have in Australia, so I was very familiar with that, and I asked them to tell me a little about it. So this is something that was a really interesting takeaway. Key difference is it's not just about repaying the community with a young person's labour or for punishment. So they see the purpose, the Swedes see the purpose of community service is as equally about ensuring that young people develop some positive employment skills. So McDonald's, believe it or not, was one of the most frequent sites in Stockholm for young people to undertake community service after having committed offences. And I was told that about 80% of young people who participate in community service, if they weren't already employed, go on to actually obtain employment, not necessarily in McDonald's. The other key difference in Sweden, and I believe this is also a feature in Denmark, I'm just going to speak to this really briefly, otherwise I'm going to run out of time, is that the courts operate very differently in those countries. So they involve people from the community as well as judges in convening and, and sentencing matters involving young people and adults for that matter. matter. So I, was at, I actually had the great privilege in northern Stockholm uh, to sit on the bench with a judge convening a matter involving a young woman who'd been charged with drug possession offences. And interestingly, the judge doesn't make the sentence. The lay people who sit on the bench with her make the, make the sentence and her role is to ensure that it's compliant with the law. So really interesting um, arrangement there. Next slide, please. So that concludes my whirlwind, whirlwind tour of the crime prevention and youth justice systems of three Nordic countries and our Commonwealth cousin, Canada. My expectations about what they do differently to prevent and respond to youth crime was well and truly exceeded. There's a high value placed on nurturing all families, which is articulated and supported as a key crime prevention strategy. And while I didn't speak to that as much in Canada, that's a very strong eth and well articulated ethos. In addition, my opinion is that these countries deliver justice in more effective and respectful ways that maintain the dignity of young people at the same time as engaging and developing the confidence of the community. My overall conclusions about what works to deliver the lower offending rates in those countries, I'll summarise down just to, just to a few points. So a visible and substantial commitment and investment in prevention and early intervention, no doubt about it. Evidence informed practice that evolves and is responsive to research and emerging trends investment in a highly skilled workforce and value placed on that work. And I will add that across the Nordic countries, a three year uh, social services degree is mandatory for all people working in the human services area, including um, juvenile justice. There's an acknowledgement that child offenders are children first. Detaining children is an absolute last resort and alternatives are used wherever possible. So next slide, please. In the following slide, it's way too busy for me to talk you through it, but you can access that slide um, in a slightly longer form in my Churchill report, and I can make available with the organisers after this for that to be sent to people who are interested in it. Basically, what it does is it summarises the key features of what I observe to be effective elements of youth justice systems in those four countries. There's a continuum there from prevention through to alternative custody environments. And I also identify some enabling and supporting factors in that um, handout. So if we had been going to do this in person, it was going to be a handout. So finally, I'd like to conclude. Next slide, please. 
My experience undertaking this fellowship in 2017 was extremely well timed. On my return, it led me to be involved in three strategic projects, one of which um, Corey has mentioned, that have fundamentally changed Queensland's youth justice system. There's the 2000 report, 2018 report, sorry, on youth justice, which was led by Mr. Bob Atkinson, and I had a, the great privilege of being a member of a team that contributed to that report. In 2019, um, following Mr. Atkinson's report, the development of Queensland's first youth justice strategy, that's a five-year strategy that remains in place, and a subsequent action plan and investment of over $300 million in new programs, services, and infrastructure. And that is ongoing in a new action plan to be developed shortly. I continue to work um, in, in the youth justice area and contribute to the ever-changing landscape in Queensland. Compared to the countries I visited, there are some fundamental socio-cultural differences within our community that I think can challenge the application of the very liberal approaches, particularly those applied in Scandinavia's, Scandinavian countries. Notwithstanding, I continue to look to and promote the experiences of other countries and indeed to research, to provide guidance for how we can address one of our current challenges, and that's serious youth offending. So as I mentioned before, we've got this trend, as had Canada experienced, of a small number of young people committing a great number of offences. I'm eternally grateful to the Winston Churchill Memorial Trust for pro providing me with this fellowship opportunity. It continues to engender in me positivity and enthusiasm to keep seeking better ways of delivering justice to the younger members of our community. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tony. I just am consistently amazed that there's such a treasure trove of interventions with such good evidence bases, mm. and yet we seem to be so slow to get traction in some of the areas. So I look forward to being able to pepper you with some good questions at the end. Um, mm. I'm seeing some fantastic themes there around family and community being engaged when there's the absence of one or the other to try and keep young people um, away from risky behaviour and coach better behaviours. About the introduction of the ideas of procedural justice through the um, uh, through the restorative justice programs and and those partnerships, you know, in my personal experiences in the city, where wherever we could be together with a service, face to face on the street with a young person, that was very impactful. And it's so good to see that that's mm -hmm. a common experience around the world. Um, thank you very much for a fantastic presentation. I'm gonna um, we've already connected, so I'll be peppering you with some questions throughout. Thank you. You're very welcome. Next, we've got Justin Francis. Um, Justin is an operational fire officer with the Queensland Fire and Emergency Services, and he's uh, 25 years in, in the service now, and he's got great experience attending and managing many thousands of emergency incidents from oil spill disasters, flooding events, wildfires, structure fires, and complex rescue incidents. Having worked in the State Disaster Coordination Centre, um, you know, you see the you see the fire emergency services and the support service of SES turn out to just about everything in Queensland, and it seems that it's happening more and more uh, with climate change and the other uh, other issues affecting the, the stability of our climate and our community safety. His uh, Churchill Fellowship in 2017 um, expanded his global research and gave him great exposure to one of the world's worst fire structure disasters, the Grenfell Tower fire in London. His fellowship also exposed him to the international shift in safety enhancements aimed at reducing work-related illnesses for people involved with firefighting, and he's been leading the implementation of this into fire agencies across Australia. Uh, thank you, Justin. I look forward to hearing from your presentation. And I just remind everyone before we flick over, there's a Q&A tab on the bottom of your screen. Don't be shy. Um, the, the curlier and more difficult the questions, so the better it is. And if we can't answer them today, the ones like for Ben, I'll make sure that they get passed on and they get an answer to you. But thank you for your participation in the chat and post your questions in the live Q&A. That'd be great. Okay, thank you very much. I'll just quickly share my screen here. Okay, so as we just discussed um, back in, can everybody see my screen? I hope that's that's working. Yeah, okay. Um, so I conducted my Churchill Fellowship back in 2017 and um, I was high rise evacuation because I noticed there was some changes going on around the world in relation to how we move people within buildings. 
and it wasn't really filtering through to Australia. Um, some other areas too, um, and, and this came from working as a firefighter, but also I had the opportunity to work in a building approval role. And that building approval role exposed me to how these buildings operate when, when there's fire. So um, I've taken a lot of that knowledge and, and shared that with firefighters around the world. Um, so my, this presentation will be in two parts. So looking at high rise evacuation and what's happening in that space, but also um, some areas that are related that are relating to um, firefighter health and safety, because um, unfortunately dying from cancer from the role of being a firefighter is there's a higher chance of that than being injured at a fire. So we need to change how we operate. So um, you'll notice this first slide here, we're looking at some buildings and, and what's happening with buildings around the world is, is there is a change and we can see they're getting taller. So the Burj Khalifa on the right there is a building in Dubai. Now, whilst we get up to 829 meters, it becomes very complex in how we actually move people out of that building when there is an emergency. And the shard on the left, which is in London, this building, the standout feature with this type of building is it's no longer just occupants residing in a building or working in an office. It's a whole mix of people. There's a hospital in that building. There's a childcare center. There's numerous restaurants. So that influences all of the different movements of how these people are going to move if there's an emergency at that building. Now to add complexity to that building, there's nowhere to actually evacuate to because it's congested, it's built out. So now we have to start looking at dispersing people away from these types of structures, which is a different concept. And now we're also using different materials. So we've all seen the, the, in the media over the last few years in relation to the cladding, the flammable cladding. So there's different materials that are coming into these structures. And, and the big one at the moment is timber high rise. And um, timber high rise buildings are now up to 80 metres in height in Norway. And in Melbourne, we have quite a high building at 30 metres as well. So timber construction, in high rise buildings is also starting to occur. So this changes what, what we're dealing with in relation to buildings and how they operate when there's a fire and an emergency. So there's been two significant influential moments in building fire safety in the last 20 plus years. And, and the first one really was September 11 and the trade towers and how we evacuated people out of those buildings. So what resulted from that, and this building in the photo here is Freedom Tower. Freedom Tower has replaced the site of where the trade towers were. Now this building's probably one of the most secure, one of the most up-to-date buildings in the US. So they've now implemented having to have extra sets of stairs, incorporating lift evacuation into these buildings, incorporating separate stairs for firefighters, using CCTV footage is crucial to be able to see what's happening and how people are moving within the building. And you'll see down the bottom right there, those TVs are actually in the fire control room so that the firefighters can actually see what the media is seeing so that they can actually see, whereas in September 11, they did not have access to that footage when the emergency was occurring. Now with the lift evacuation, that's gonna be a key theme on what I'm gonna talk about a little bit later on, but the US does, has implemented lift evacuation instead of having a third set of stairs. And that's a really important aspect, but unfortunately it hasn't really expanded to the amount that it needs to, and I'll explain why. We're also looking in places like Tokyo, where we're now starting to mix over 100,000 people in these built up communities within one complex, spreading out into these mega complexes. Now, how do you shift 110,000 people? How do you communicate with 110,000 people when there's an emergency? Okay, now they even have concepts like helicopter evacuation, which is not really used in the US or in Australia, but these are looking at some different options of what's out there. And then we look across into some of the other buildings where they have an alternative means of escape through a ladder on the balcony. Now that's, uh, you lift up that little stainless steel hood, a ladder drops down and you can evacuate down to the next floor. And then some really radical ideas from using those escape hoods where that person's wearing a hood on their face so they can breathe in smoke to get out through to evacuator descending devices off high rise buildings. Now these are very different concepts and, um, but what we have to accept is we need an alternative means of escape in buildings so that people have the opportunity to escape through to sky bridges. So maybe we need to evacuate into the neighboring building as you can see in Singapore or over in London. And that is starting to happen a little bit around Australia. And then we, as we get into these mega structures like Shanghai Tower, which is over 600 meters, it's now been accepted that we can't evacuate people. It's not practical to be able to walk people down for over an hour in a set of stairs. So now we have refuge floors. And you'll see in that middle photo there, that 
floor is every 15 to 20 floors and that accommodates people evacuating so they actually stay in that floor and don't evacuate from the building and each one of those floors is vacant and it's left there for evacuation purposes only and that's very much an asian concept in a lot of um, the asian countries and and the burj khalifa the photo i showed you earlier because as we get taller we can't actually physically expect people to be able to walk down these stairs now these photos here on the left this is a this is probably some of the most influential moments on my churchill fellowship um, this photo was taken in the 1960s and it was part of the research within this book pedestrian planning and design by john fruin now you'll notice in that stairwell there's two people standing either side evacuating when we look at evacuation today we don't walk downstairs like that anymore we actually walk single file and we're generally on a mobile phone, we're carrying a backpack, we're carrying a dog. So that is not what evacuation looks like, yet that is what it is based on. That's, those figures on those evacuation trials is what we still use today to determine how we're going to evacuate people out of buildings. And you'll see the photo in the middle is in the tube in London. People have backpacks on. There's, there's numerous um, different ages and abilities of people to move, be able to move. And you can see there's not a person in that photo that doesn't have a mobile phone. Um, the bottom photo there is Dr. Eric Marchant, and um, he advised me um, that back in the 60s, uh, actually, no, in the early 1900s, there was a theatre in Edinburgh where they played, the orchestra played the music, God Save the Queen. And that was what determined how quickly people had to get out of the building. They had to be out before the music finished, which was two and a half minutes. Now, that's what is based on a theatre evacuation, which is two and a half minutes, and it's based on a piece of music. Um, so there's some, when we look at changing worlds, some of this theory is still in place today. So I, I would say evacuation is pretty slow to change, yet the structures of high rise buildings is very fast to change. And, and I had the honor of meeting Jack Bruin, who's in his late nineties, and I got to travel out and spend some time with him. And, and that was quite an amazing moment. Now, one of the, when we look at people moving in buildings, the slowest person influences the evacuation speed for everybody in that building. So if I'm walking slowly down the stairs, that's the speed that you're evacuating at. Now, what we have to look at is eight to 13% of people in a building have mobility impairments. Now that, can, that seems like a high figure, but that ranges from a sporting injury through to having a pacemaker installed, through to being heavily pregnant. To, um, so, to, so you can imagine there's a range of reasons why somebody may not be able to walk, even carrying a small child or walking with your pet slows the, your speed of being able to walk down those stairs. And then we look at um, two to 3% of people can't actually even walk downstairs. Yet we base all of these buildings on stairwell evacuation. And you can see here back in the 1600s, this is in Copenhagen, back in, in that time, we even had a ramp within a building. Now I'm not saying that's gonna occur in every building, but it, it, it was possible back in the 1600s. Now this standout building in Stockholm, the Scandic Victoria Tower was quite controversial because they, eliminated a set of stairs and put in lifts instead of that set of stairs to use for the evacuation. And so I think when I turned up at that building, I was probably ready to criticize it. But when you witnessed what, how it worked, it was very hard to criticize. It had one set of perfectly fire isolated stairs pressurized, and then we had a set of lifts and, and what this did, and these lifts have backup power, that there's a lot involved in how they're set up. Now, those lifts afford everybody the ability to now evacuate that building, as opposed to this outdated concept that we can only rely on stairs. And through my travels, um, visiting the lift test facility from Kony in China and seeing what sort of technology and where we're going with the use of lifts within buildings. Um, now, along the way, we all get to experience numerous meetings on a Churchill Fellowship. Now, this one was certainly my standout. It was in Toronto. Now, Jake Pauls, the elderly gentleman up on the left, he's become my mentor since my fellowship. And I've met up with him numerous times at other conferences, and, and he certainly assisted me along the way with his knowledge. He's had 50 years of research in evacuation. So he is the worldwide expert in this space. Now, what we were talking about at this meeting, which was recorded, was evacuation and high rise and our concerns within fire safety within these high rise buildings. The significant aspect of this meeting is it was 24 hours before the Grenfell fire. So here we were talking about some of our concerns and 24 hours later in another country, this was the next game changing moment like we witnessed with September 11. Now the Grenfell fire is the next trigger to create change. 
And you can see here some photos and, and walking around the site, um, I certainly couldn't get inside the building, but walking around with the London Fire Brigade and hearing their experiences, you know, this was a deeply shocked community. This should not happen. This is a building in 2017 and 72 people lost their lives. Now it's not just a cladding issue, there's numerous failures within this, but we need to learn about the evacuation side. Why did 72 people not make it out of that building? Now, when we compare this to Australia, we, we, we tended to think that we were kind of all right, that we don't have any issues, but the La Crosse building in Melbourne, this fire occurred before Grenfell, and this triggered some concern with cladding in Australia. Now, the difference with the evacuation in that building is the evacuation started three minutes into, into the fire whereas the Grenfell fire was an hour and 53 minutes. Um, there was pressurised stairwells. There was a communication system. The Grenfell fire did not have um, a communication system. So I think Australia kind of thought, well, we've, we've had a, a successful result, even though it was a fire, we've, we've managed to get people out. But I still have concerns with these under 25 metre high buildings that have no sprinkler protection, um, single stairwells sometimes, not pressurised, and you can see the photo down on the bottom right. This happened in Bankstown and this resulted in just out of Sydney in one girl jumping to her death from an under 25 metre high building. Now there's been some changes starting to occur that I won't go into today. But um, how do we put some value in fire and life safety on these buildings? So one of the concepts I came up with was a fire and life safety rating. We value cars for what the rating and the safety rating is. And you can see there 92% of cars now sold in Australia have an NCAP rating. So there's a power to having this power, this high rating that your car's safe. We value environmental efficiency. We have ratings for that. Um, we value, even in New Zealand, they have an earthquake prone rating system. So you can tell how susceptible your building is to earthquakes. Yet when it comes back to foreign life safety, we have nothing. Now, interestingly, the UK has started to adopt a part of this concept and they've now started to develop the fire mark rating system. So I've lectured and presented that in numerous countries to try and spread the word. Let's put some value back into foreign life safety and inform the occupier as to what they're buying into as a part to just buying a building um, with a drop off pool. Now, I'll just talk a little bit about firefighter health and safety. This was an influential meeting with Joe Finn, the commissioner in, in the Boston Fire Service. And this was a very traditional fire service that was having a firefighter diagnosed with cancer every month. And Joe decided this was unacceptable and they've completely overhauled the organisation. And this was one of the standout features of my fellowship is that's what I'm now trying to do in Australia and New Zealand. And we're starting to slowly make some inroads in that space. And you can see the photo on the top right where we actually have exposure penetrating through our turnout gear. I suppose five years ago, I didn't realise how dangerous it was. I knew that we're in chemicals when we're in a fire, but this is also absorbing through our skin. So we need to start to look at measures and how we're going to do this, right down to cleaning our turnout clothing on the bottom right there. And this is one of my firefighter colleagues that I've worked with for many years who unfortunately passed away last year. And it's witnessing things like this, that we need change in Australia and it has to occur. It's not optional. And that is starting, but um, I, I don't want to see any more of this occur. And you can see in the recent bushfire season, um, last year like you can see firefighters there's still shortcuts being taken i used to think bushfire smoke was safe but we know now know there's numerous chemicals hydrogen cyanide um, formaldehyde these are dangerous chemicals and you can see the photo on the right one firefighter standing there without any protective clothing so there's huge change that needs to occur in that space so what we've done in qfest within queensland is start implementing a, an evac um, a decontamination method so every firefighter now has the appropriate equipment to clean themselves at the fire grounds. It's no good leaving these chemicals on us. We need to get them off us on the fire ground. So that's changed our culture and it started to get people interested in thinking about it. Um, we've started looking at changing our station design, how we clean fire appliances, equipment, fire hose, having different procedures, educating firefighters, recording our exposure. So there's a whole range of measures that we're now starting to do a complete overhaul back within. And this is now about to go national um, and through a different method. And you can see here a firefighter now conducting that decontamination method. And, and interestingly, this cleaning machine was used to clean our breathing apparatus sets. And I, I found this in Sweden during my Churchill Fellowship. Well, that machine now is in my fire station um, at Cannon Hill in Brisbane. So there, we have made inroads and that 
that's been influenced by what I got to experience. And we have some world-class standards of cleaning our equipment. I'm um, almost at the end here. So just obviously we all get to meet a lot of people along the way and from meeting people who have lost their husbands during September 11 to getting challenged at dinners with people who are experts in the field through to sitting on the NFPA board with high rise building fire safety. Um, like it's, it's an amazing opportunity. And, and one, one thing I didn't realize is my fellowship still continuing. I haven't stopped being exposed. It probably started a lot of it. And now I'm still on that same journey and I've probably been busier than I ever have been. Now, the letter on the right, I like to show this because the Churchill Fellowship is also about pushing the boundaries. And when I was in Finland thinking about, and the Churchill, I'm um, sorry, the Grenfell fire had occurred, I figured I was being funded by Winston Churchill or the fellowship. The Queen was good friends with Winston Churchill or was a, was a colleague of his. So I wrote, a, I learned how to write a letter to the Queen and was trying to organize a meeting with the Queen when I was in London to share my experiences. Unfortunately, I didn't get to meet with her because it was a bit of a political situation, but um, it's about attempting to create every opportunity from standing on the, the New York Stock Exchange floor, looking at how they evacuate that building. Well, I tried to meet with the Queen. Um, just finishing up, um, being a firefighter, we all like to look at different fire appliances around the world. So these are obviously some of the cooler appliances I've seen along the way from in Dubai through to jet packs and fast response vehicles in Singapore. And then some of the worst emergency response vehicles and maybe Ben from the police would like to man this vehicle on the left in China, or you can see the, probably the world's worst fire appliance that I've seen in Tokyo. And just the last slide, look, it is a changing world, but I think you can see evacuation and how we move people needs to change a little bit further. And we really do need to incorporate other methods in how we move people with mobility challenges. Everybody should be able to visit, work, reside, and manage emergencies in both old and new buildings with complete confidence for their own personal safety. And the other areas, firefighters love their job. I love my job, but it's not worth dying from a preventable disease. So let's change how we operate. So thank you for your time. Yeah, Justin, it's just a revelation to hear that it's uh, the advances in lift technology might solve one of those long-standing disasters about being stuck in stairwells and these multi-purpose constructions. Um, I, I was following the chat in this one and people are just uh, surprised to see how the, the design of buildings and the construction and density of living in multi-purpose has changed the work for you and particularly how you've grabbed a, a thread from your study and applied it to the safety of our emergency services workers here in Australia. It's very commendable. Uh, I, I particularly loved your comment that my church will fellowship still going on. I'm sure there's many of us that agree exactly the same, that what, what that experience gave us is the little spark in our belly to continue and it's continued to grow and burn long since our fellowship has seemed to finish and at least on paper anyway. Thank you. So if I could just, now we'll be moving to the Brady Bunch segment where um, all the presenters are on the screen and we do have some really good questions in the chat um, and I've managed to put a few in there as well. Um, just a note, there was a question for Ben. I'm going to take that one away and he'll be at the dinner tonight, but uh, I'll make sure we get back to that. Um, the first question from Jackie Charles. Um, Tony, how does, uh, um, for Tony, how does the role of education intersect with some of the strategies that you outlined? Um, it's, it's in the strategies that I saw overseas, it is a key component. So, um, if that's what you're asking. Um, so, for example, in the residential centres that I visited, um, education was actually de being delivered to children and young people in those facilities. So rather than them having to go and attend a mainstream school, the schooling was brought to them. Um, that played out in a range of different ways depending upon the actual facility. Um, but, yeah, schooling was an absolute integral um, I'm just trying to think about other countries I visited. So um, the residential facilities in um, uh, Finland, also schooling was a very much a key part. So one of the things I did get to see though was the different learning tools that they use in that environment. And it was really critical. There was a key understanding that the learning need to be delivered to where the young person was at based on their previous experience with school and based on their own capability. So it was very much an individualized model. So education was seen as a pathway for kids to achieve something positive and then 
in future lead into some vocational or employment opportunity. So I would say every country, it was a critical component. Does that answer your question? Well, I think so as well. Without um, putting Mr. Carlos on the spot, in your experience, you know, education, in Indigenous communities in those areas, you know, are a very important role. Yeah, it certainly is. Um, you know, from our point of view, and I see a question from Jack and there along those same lines, um, which I'll get to in a moment. But I think you know the education is a critical feature, and as I mentioned in my presentation, the ability to educate people was often only a distance, and uh, that created some significant difficulties for people who are from remote communities. So. Mm. Um, you know, I think if we can mould particular uh, programs to deal with that, those unique issues that confront Indigenous Australians, particularly, I think, uh, um, you know, we're going to see a better society out of it. Nothing more than just the education that happens when, when young people are involved in, you know, I'll, I'll call it schooling, but I just get this feeling that going. Where people are engaging with you in a way that's you know respectful and considerate and that safety element do you think that plays a role in the value of of what we call education just participating in that activity um i i absolutely think it does and look i'm not for one minute suggesting these the sorts of things don't happen in australia we've got an amazing range of alternative education op options that do offer individualized education for children and young people but I guess in a state of <clears throat> Queensland, as, as Morris has, I guess, um, inferred, the challenges of distance make that really difficult for all kids in need to be able to access it. That's a great segue into the question. Another question from Jackie for you, Mr. Carlos. Um, thank you for your great presentation from Jackie Charles. Do you think that digital inclusion in Indigenous communities could be positively impacted by culturally appropriate online legal education for school students. And she points to some uh, game-based um, legal literacy programs that she's discovered as part of her resources um, in other countries. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, thanks, Jackie. Um, I think any uh, appropriate medium that makes digital ability or, and affordability and access more pervasive in uh, indigenous communities and those, I know my talk focused on indigenous communities, but it relates to all those communities who may feel marginalised from the mainstream. I think if you can, any of those mediums that might be able to be uh, pushed into those areas, it improves engagement and that uh, reduces the gap uh, and the ability to actually engage in broader economic uh, government services and so forth, which improves quality of life. The only caveats I put on that, I, I think, is that um, is the particular community ready for that particular resource? Oftentimes, we have a one-size-fits-all approach to programs and systems, but communities are quite different and diverse in the way in which they uh, approach different things. And indeed, some community leaders in Queensland's remote communities um, are resistant to some of the technology and infrastructure because they're fearful or unfamiliar with it and indeed um, have seen some of the negative impacts of it around uh, pornography and so forth. So they they are suspicious. And so I think if, if the program is right for the community and the community readiness is there, then uh, there, there's probably no program that's, if it, if it advances those particular aims, I think it's, uh, it's a fantastic idea. Uh, without um, putting Tony on, um, say again, Justin on the spot. Um, Justin, I'm concerned about some of your presentation in that the, the way that housing affordability is going, at least in Australia, that we've seen that it seems to be pushing people into these high density residences just for a matter of this, you know, how do you afford to buy a house in Sydney or how do you afford in some of the very high priced areas? Mm -hmm. Is that, is that a, a driver for some of your problems? Yeah, so um, that's an interesting point because from the Bankstown fire, the coroner recommended that there had to be changes, but they had to be affordable. So how do we make these buildings safer? So one of the outcomes has actually ended up being sprinkler protection is now going to be in, in place in under 25 metre high buildings. 
So, and, and it's done in a slightly watered down version, but it, there's been a lot of testing in New South Wales and they've proven that it's still quite an effective, safe method. So that's an example of implementing some safety measures, but still doing it in a cheap, cost-effective mm -hmm. way so that everybody can be provided with that same level of safety. Question just popped up on the chat for you, Justin, while you're on a run. Um, do, you, do you often call on your overseas Churchill networks? This is from Damien Salmon. Do you often call on your overseas Churchill networks for your emerging work in firefighting safety? And do you think this would be possible if you hadn't made those connections through the fellowship? Um, oh, look, it's definitely increased the network. And like, as of two nights ago, I was sitting there on a conference doing exactly what we're doing here. And that was through the network of people I met through the fellowship. And I was kind of representing Australia on the high rise space and someone from Toronto. And so, yeah, it's, it's invaluable. And, um, and I think something that's been really important is getting the right couple of mentors through the process and, and one of them was the elderly gentleman Jake Pauls because he opened up his book of contacts to me and without people like that um, I wouldn't have been able to expand that to the level I have and and even just mentioning his name of being able to meet with people it, it opens the door to get me into everywhere so the Churchill Fellowship does too but finding some really good mentors has been invaluable. While we're on a run, there's an anonymous question for you again, Justin. High-rise buildings would seem to be more accessible in terms of general living with elevators and amenities on site. It does seem to be a one-stop shop in some of the new developments I've seen. You know, there's shopping, dining, living, gyms, all sorts of yeah. facilities all tucked into one. Even people might live and work in the same building. Um, is there any indication there are increased number of people have been uh, unable to evacuate by stairs when they're living and working in a high-rise building, whether that be because of the way the building constructed or perhaps even the aging nature of our community itself and their limited mobility. Yeah. So what's currently occurring is quite often people who have mobility challenges are left in the building. Okay. And that can be a sound method sometimes, but everybody still needs to be provided with the ability to evacuate from a building. And some of the methods that I showed in um, Sweden and Finland has taken it even further is that they've started to, I wouldn't say make it compulsory, but it's been done in a very cost-effective manner. So they've eliminated a little bit of stairwell cost and put that money into, into lift evacuation. So um, I, I really think it's a way of the future, but, and you can see in the US how they've brought that method in, but nobody's adopted it in the US because they looked at it too, it was too expensive. So it definitely has to, it, it, it's come into a couple of buildings in Australia, but it needs to go further because as, as I don't know if anybody who's listening who's has ever walked down a 300 metre high building, but it's it's not easy for anybody. No, I've seen that even those challenges in the city about running up and down stairs for charity and uh, I haven't made my way into one of those yet, but I'd hate to be doing it under pressure when it's crowded and cramped. And if, as you say, lift technology is advanced so much that they're becoming safer and a more efficient way of evacuating people and, under pressure, perhaps that's a balancing act that people who design and construct buildings can, can say. I can say on some of the chat too, there was a particular commendation for your rating system and that idea is getting that in the way we rate and regulate the, the construction of buildings, uh, like the ANCAP safety rating has had a significant impact on the safety of motor vehicles and other uh, motor vehicle accidents in Australia as well. Um, that, that's probably been this one of the most um, the area that most people want to speak about. So when I've presented in other countries, that has definitely got interest. And I have presented that to New South Wales in response to that Bankstown fire as an option because the coroner did suggest that they need some sort of rating system. So all of anybody that's listening today who lives in a building, tell me what level of fire and life safety your building is. Nobody would know. Mm. It's the minimum standard of whatever was set at the time it was built. So let's give people some information. We've got time for one more question and I'll take the um, take the opportunity to pose this one myself to um, Tony and uh, Mr. Carlos. The, how do we make the balance between effective interventions in youth offending and political or popular interventions? You know, like you see things like boot camp that are popular with some people and really appeal with with a large number of people that don't actually have a very good evidence base for success. Uh, what is what is the balance and how do how do we um, 
push back against interventions that may seem popular but we know to be ineffective. I guess um, I'll go first because I don't Please do. follow Tony on that one. No. Um, it's a, I think you're right. There's a inherent uh, statement in your question, I suppose, that um, for many, I think it's about fear. It's about fear in the community. And um, for me, it's really important to educate the community on what works rather than what feels good. Um, I think we'd have a far better opportunity to um, have some very good evidence-based programs in youth justice. At the moment, I think a lot of the reaction comes from uh, fear of you know, the community, what might happen, rather than a, a good sense of the actual evidence of, of um, mm. the futility of some of the things we're currently doing. Um, but I'll leave Tony on. She's far more expert in this area than I am. No, I, th I think um, education and information is key, but sadly, even when there's information, a lot of information around and research that um, suggests that things like scared pra skate pro sorry, scared straight programs and boot camps don't work, they still keep getting suggested. So I think that you're right about the fear. So some of the other ways that you would need to complement the information with other strategies. And I actually think that that's about trying to encourage and involve people in working with young people. So members of the community and doing that and actually having the opportunity to get to know young people and understand their circumstances. Um, I think that would be a helpful strategy as well. Um, yeah, it is a really tricky one. And um, I see it all the time in my job. And we do go back and revisit the past quite a lot. And certainly, um, you know, as I say, there's plenty of information out there. And the message from our government is those sorts of things don't work, but people still continue to suggest them. So, um, yeah, I think actually holding their hand and taking them to meet young people, showing them the things that do work, that's, oh, that's another strategy that we can use and we need to do more often is where we do, we have excellent programs and services being delivered in Queensland, not only by government, but by the community. I think we need to be demonstrating those, shouting them from the rafters that they do work. I remember um, a couple of years ago, a fellow called Vincent Sheraldi visited from the United States. So he'd been credited with reducing the custody rate significantly in New York State. And one of the things when they were embarking on their big program of reform, he said, was that you need to have a bank of good news stories. So there will inevitably be things that go wrong, but you need to have that bank that you can draw on and you build the goodwill by constantly promoting those good news stories and case studies about what does work. And tell a story around it, a young person and their family, rather than just a theoretical piece of, what would seem like a theoretical piece of research. So those are, yeah, a couple of suggestions. Mm. Lovely note to end this uh, session on that who would have thought telling a story, meeting people personally and sharing <laughs> that story could be one of the most powerful things we can mm. do to influence change. So thank you mm. sincerely for your effort and for managing the digital platform very well. We we'll really appreciate the fact that it's not easy for everyone. And um, I'll close our session here and welcome everyone. I think we're out next to take a break for lunch. It's your, your shout. Great. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.